so much for your introduction, Maya, and thank you um, to all our attendees today. Um, let me just get my screen all set up. Okay, so it says only the host can share in this meeting. Maybe if I could get permission to share my screen. Okay, thank you. All right, one sec. Okay, so again, thank you so much to everyone um, who attended today. My presentation is entitled College App Hacks, and I will be sharing some tips and tricks I picked up from my own application experience. So to start, let me introduce myself. I'm Sabine, a rising sophomore at Tufts this fall, double majoring in biology and biotechnology on the pre-dental track. I studied at Poveda until grade 10 and graduated from the Ateneo Senior High School last year under the STEM strand. All right, so here are my tips for a stress-free application season. Well, as stress-free as possible, because we all know that this is a long process that requires a lot of hard work. So my first tip is to create your common app account as early as now. This is the platform you'll be using to submit most of your applications. Each year, the common app opens on August 1st, so you can actually start doing this um, in a couple of weeks. The common app will first ask for a lot of information from you, like personal information, stuff about your family, educational history, basic questions you want to get out of the way. So you don't have to worry about them later on. Um, yeah, so there are quite a lot of these questions and they take some time to fill up actually. So um, it's nice to get started on those right away so you don't have to worry about them anymore. One thing to note is that the Common App is used only for US schools. Other countries have their own systems and some schools have platforms unique to them only, like the UCs and Georgetown or MIT. So you'll also have to research on those for um, other schools. Eventually, you will add your high school counselor to the Common App and you will need the following. Your official high school transcript, a record of your class rank, a certificate of, a certificate of English as medium of instruction at your school, and a high school profile. The last two, marked with an asterisk, are optional. But if you don't come from an international school like I did, I suggest you request for a certificate of English as a medium of instruction. Not all schools will require this, but it's nice to have one handy. Then there's the high school profile. Now this one is an interesting one because not all schools have one on file. This document basically provides the admissions officers an idea of what kind of high school you came from. And it should include information like class size, like how many um, students were you in your batch, the curriculum used in your school, whether um, it was the Philippine K-12 curriculum, IB, stuff like that. Um, third is the AP classes offered at your school, if any. Your school's grading system. And lastly, any orgs, sports teams, or leadership positions that are offered in your school. This is important because schools want to see that you took the hardest courses among what's available to you and um, 
took all the opportunities to whether join a sport, um, be a captain in that sport, or um, run for a leadership position. Um, those are very important um, to the admissions officers. If you transferred schools naman like me, you, you want to make sure you can still get in touch with the registrar of your old school because you will actually um, need a lot of things from them, documents. It's also best to request for these documents early because they do take time to process and um, this is not something you want to take care of last minute. All right, so tip number two is to start building your college list. Begin your research on schools you're interested in applying to. If you don't know where to start, you can create your own criteria of what's most important to you, what are your priorities, or you can follow the one, um, a simple one I have created here. So first, um, consider location, weather, culture, accessibility, safety, and proximity from relatives and family is one that I personally found very important in choosing my school's location. Second is program. Does this school have a good program for the kind of study I want to do? Like for me, as a pre-dental, I knew that Tufts had an excellent dental school, which is why I really wanted to study there. Um, so the kind of school you will apply to will definitely vary, whether you want to do engineering, arts, music. There are so many to choose from. Third is tuition, of course. You can ask yourself, is this school generous with financial aid? Can my family support my education here? So these are stats that are readily available on Google. Um, just some basic searching will um, get you answers to these questions. So although it's tempting to apply to all the schools you can, you sh definitely should set a budget. Each school has their own application fee ranging from around 70 to 90 US dollars. And that can definitely add up. And so will the number of essays you will have to write. And trust me, it's not easy to, to write these essays. Um, it takes so much time and energy, many, many revisions. So definitely narrow down your school list. So a good strategy is to, is to apply to around eight to 10 different colleges. So um, that would be divided into two safety schools, which are schools you are most likely to get into, meaning your GPA is higher than their average, like the average um, admitted student's GPA. Then four target schools, which are schools you have a reasonable chance of getting into, meaning your GPA is within their average. And then two reach schools, schools that are very selective and probably most likely have a lower chance of getting into. So obviously these would be like the IVs and like Stanford, MIT, or basically like the, the top 20 rank. Um, or that may even extend past the top 20. Okay. So tip number three is to take note of the application deadlines and decide if you will apply ED or EA. Just to recap, when you apply early decision, you sign a binding contract. And so if you are admitted, you must enroll at that school. You can only apply it to one early decision school, so make sure that you really like it. Early action, on the other hand, is almost the same thing, except you don't have to enroll at that school if you're admitted early. There is no binding contract. And you can also apply to as many early action schools as you want, along with your um, regular decision. 
applications. So here are some important dates to take note of. First, um, it's good to know the SAT and ACT test schedules. You're going to want to be taking these standardized tests as early as like grade 10, grade 11. Um, and you can, you can take these tests as many times as you want to get your best possible score. So the test schedules are readily available online. And you can already mark those in your calendar and sign up for a test because um, slots do fill up. Next, TOEFL schedules. Um, U.S. schools don't really um, require TOEFL scores in my experience, but it is the Canadian schools that do. So if you're applying to UBC, U of T, um, or any other Canadian school, you'll likely need um, a TOEFL score. And there are actually a lot of schedules for this, so it's not as difficult to um, schedule as the SAT or ACT. Third um, is the ED slash EA deadlines. These are usually around late October to early November. Um, each school has a different EDEA deadline, but the most common would be November 1, usually. Can be earlier, can also be later. Fourth is the UC application deadline. So this one is um, earlier than most other schools' deadlines. So that's November 30. And then regular decision would be January 1 for most schools. Some um, do them a bit later, but usually around the first week of January is when they're due. Also check out the Your Application Timeline talk later in the conference for specific details. Okay, so my fourth tip for you guys is to organize everything in a spreadsheet. It will make your life a thousand times easier, I promise. Um, here's how I organized mine, but obviously there's no right or wrong way. Um, so in my first tab, I basically just put an overview of all the schools I wanted to apply to, except I sorted them out first by country, and then I labeled all of them as safety, target, or reach. And I also labeled um, if, it was, if I was applying to that school, ED, EA, or RD. Tab two, a list of all the schools arranged according to their application deadline. So basically, it was just one column with all the school names. Um, second column, I put their deadlines and then I rearranged that sheet um, according to deadline just so you can like visually see like what order you want to finish things in. So then tab three, paste all the supplementary essay prompts of all the schools you will apply to and group together similar prompts. So basically you just classify them based on the type of question. If, if they're similar enough to um, basically use the same basic or base essay answer, you can group those together. But I do not recommend um, copy pasting the exact same essays for every school because sometimes the prompts um, are not exactly identical, just similar. So um, just make sure to revise accordingly. Tab four is a list of all your extracurricular activities. Now, this is for the Common App. And the Common App allows you to put 10 activities maximum. So these next bullets are um, 
what they will ask in the Common App website. So they'll ask activity type, position slash leadership description, organization name, then they'll make you describe the activity. Um, in, and there's a maximum number of characters. So make sure to take note of that um, character count as well. Then grade slash year level, you did the activity, timing of participation, hours per week, weeks per year, and a checkbox if you intend to participate in that same activity in college. Basically, this is just so that you can draft what you're going to answer um, outside the Common App platform. And then when you finalized everything, then you can paste it to your Common App. And then tab five, um, just uh, my passwords for um, application portals. Because each school, after submitting your application, they'll give you like um, a portal um, link and then you'll have to create accounts for all those schools. So it's nice to have a passwords tab just to keep track. All right, my next tip is to take the SAT or ACT if you can. Despite many schools being test optional nowadays, a high score can only enhance your application. After all, you can choose which specific schools you want to send your test scores to later on. And if you're not happy with your score, you can just not send them at all. But it doesn't hurt to try. Tip, you can find the average SAT scores of applicants to a particular school online with just a simple Google search. If your score is above that school's average, it is safe to submit your scores. If your scores fall below the average, maybe consider not submitting. If your score lies within the average, you may or may not submit your scores depending on how confident you are with your application. Okay, tip number six. And I know that um, many speakers in the future conference events are also going to say this, but start writing your essays as early as now if you're um, an incoming senior in high school. Particularly, the 650-word personal statement for the Common App. Senior year is stressful enough but with college applications on top of that, things may quickly go haywire. Dedicate some time this summer to writing essays because I promise you they will all go through a lot of revisions. Essay prompts are typically the same every year and they may be, they may be found in the Common App or in the school's website. Here are the typical types of essays you will make for your applications. First, like I said, is the personal statement. And um, this has a maximum of 650 words. And you can talk about anything. There are suggested prompts on the Common App um, website. But the last prompt literally says, like, write whatever you want or something around that. Second is why our school. Almost every school will ask you to write an essay about why you want to go to that, their school. And this is usually around 150 to 300 words. And make sure to point out things you genuinely like about that school. Um, mention things that are unique to that school only. Um, a general essay will not get you the acceptance letter. So make sure to be very, very specific when you write these why us essays. Third, other prompts. So these are about 250 to 400 words, usually about why you chose your major or a challenge you, challenge you overcame, 
um, any leadership experience or how you've impact, impacted your community, etc. Um, yeah, it definitely varies um, per school. But usually these are the three essays that a school would ask you to write, specifically the US schools. Okay, last tip. Tip number seven is about letters of recommendation. Ask for letters of recommendation from teachers who know you very well, teachers you really connected with in high school. Make sure you have at least two to three teachers who really know you and you trust will write a good recommendation for you. Also, at least one of them should teach a subject related to your intended major. It's also important to have a close relationship with your guidance counselor because all schools require a recommendation letter from your school counselor. Also, make sure to ask your teachers early because of course they're busy too. Most students tend to overlook this requirement and request for them at the last minute and chances are your teachers are writing for many other students as well. In Ateneo, when I was a senior, um, some teachers even gave like a deadline on when they would stop accepting requests to write um, recommendations. So really write, um, really contact your teachers early and um, tell them that you want them to write a recommendation for you. And they gladly will. Lastly, I found it quite helpful to also prepare a document that kind of just talked about myself like what kind of student I am, a memorable experience I had with that particular teacher I was asking a recommendation for, uh, my favorite project in their class, stuff like that, because it will really help the teacher remember you, especially because um, you guys, um, as far as I know, had half or maybe more than half of your high school years online. So this document is very important just so that your teachers have stuff to write about you and be as specific as possible. And yeah, that's basically the end of my little college apps in a nutshell presentation. And we can now move on to answering any of your questions. All right, hi Sabine, thank you so much for your talk. We really appreciate you being able to give us a comprehensive and succinct overview of the college application process. With that, we have a few questions from people in the chat box. Remember to keep your questions coming if you would still like to ask them and that some of these simpler questions will be answered through text by members of the camp team. So firstly, um, one question is, which places in the US have the cheapest cost of living and, more, and are more generous in terms of financial aid? Okay, so this really depends. In my opinion, in general, unfortunately, the US tends to have um, a quite high cost of living in general. In terms of schools that are more generous in financial aid, there's actually a lot. Um, I don't have any specifics at the top of my head right now. Um, but it is like a really quick Google search lang. So yeah. Perfect, thank you. Next question. Are you allowed to not choose any schools for early decision, i.e. only applying early action? And if possible, could you share some benefits of applying EA or ED versus applying regular? Oh yeah, absolutely. You absolutely do not need to apply anywhere early decision if you don't want to. It's just advantageous if number one, that school is competitive and 
number two if you really really want to go there so um the advantage of applying early decision and early action is um because the deadline is earlier the pool of students who are applying and the pool of students who are being considered is smaller compared to the regular decision pool thus the acceptance rate is higher so um i don't super remember the specific percentages anymore but let's say um if the regular decision acceptance rate of a really highly ranked school is three percent their ed acceptance rate could be as high as like 11 to 15 percent so yeah that's the difference and that's the advantage all right thank you next question i'll just try to group them in one um when do you recommend that students start taking the sats and acts should they try maybe in 10th grade or wait till they're in senior high school and do you have any tips on studying for these kinds of tests Okay, so usually the process is that in 10th grade, you'll take like the pre-SAT. It's basically like a mock SAT that isn't, like you get a score, but isn't, it isn't like official because it's just like a practice um, SAT, but gives you like the full experience of taking it. Then um, junior year is usually when most people take the SAT for the first time. And if they want to take it again to improve their score, they would the summer before their senior year or within their senior year, since there are there are multiple um, schedules within the year. To prepare for this, um, the, the practice SAT exams provided by College Board are really, really helpful. When I took the SAT, it was still the, it wasn't like online yet. Um, I believe um, College Board is switching the SAT to a computer test um, starting this year. I'm not super sure. But the best way to practice is by answering mock exams. And there are a lot online. And there's even like official um, full-length practice exams on Khan Academy that are really helpful to take. Um, Although like studying the topics in the SAT is important, I think what's even more helpful is just practicing and learning the test taking skills. Thank you very much, Sabine. Now, this will be the last question about standardized testing. If any of you want to learn more about standardized testing, you can attend our panel, which will be hosted later on in the conference. So the last question is, will, so, will taking standardized tests improve somebody's chances at admission? And is it recommended to take both the SAT and ACT? Yeah, definitely. Um, um, if your scores are high, um, which and the meaning of high is dependent on the school you're applying to. Like I said, right? Um, these different schools have different average um, SAT scores of their like admitted class. And if your score is higher than their average, then yes, definitely it will help improve your application. Then for the question about taking both the SAT and ACT, no, it's not really necessary to take both. They're quite similar. The only difference um, with the ACT is that it has a science portion. It's not really science um, like memorization. It's more of 
it's kind of like the reading comprehension section, except in like science form, like analyzing research papers and stuff. You can take practice tests of both before deciding which one um, suits you better or which one you think will um, garner you a better score. Thank you, Sabine. Next question. How do you recommend approaching teachers and our counselor for recommendation letters? So I personally chose teachers that I was already close with in high school. And most of these teachers were my um, class moderators or class advisors. Um, so it wasn't really that hard for me to approach them. Some of them, I told them um, through Zoom, like after class, I just asked them, well, because my senior year was also online. I, I told them after class or a lot of them, I really just emailed. Um, just be yourself, be polite. And as long as they remember you and know who you are they they will reply and um even my teachers from my junior high who taught me like two years before I started my application spa they were still willing to write me recommendation letters so it's um it's not that daunting naman. Okay, great. Thank you, Sabine. Another question is, would it be better if both of the teacher recommendation letters are from a subject related to my intended major or diverse should letters of recommendation be? Um, yeah, that could be helpful, actually, if you could um, have two teachers who thought subjects related to your major write you recommendations. But usually schools um, let you submit like, so one would be from your counselor and then you can usually have two to three or even four um, other recommendations. So you can have two who are related to your major, you can have a third one that's not, and. You can even ask if like your varsity or something, you can have your coach write you a recommendation. Um, yeah, like some schools, they don't like limit you on who will write your recommendation. Thank you very much. Another question is what kind of extracurriculars does a school judge or analyze, i.e. Do, do schools want to learn more about a student's academic interests and their extracurriculars or their hobbies and things like that? Honestly, it's nice to have a nice balance of both. That's what I did. Um, so I had certain things that were um, related to academics. I had some that were um, sports um, and the arts like music and I the extracurriculars I put in my common app basically were um, covered many different aspects like equally. Okay thank you Sabine. Another question is, what do you think are the most important things colleges look for in applications? Do we need to have lots of extracurriculars or really good essays? Definitely, I think the most important are your essays. And essays can even compensate for um, not as good like academics. Even if your grades aren't like straight A's, you don't need that as long as your essays are really nice and you can captivate um, the reader, um, tell a really good story. It's really all about being a good storyteller and expressing 
who you truly are and what you can contribute to the school. Um, as for extracurriculars, yes, those are also important. Um, and so are your grades and your SAT scores. But the thing that really wraps everything together and has the heaviest weight, in my opinion, are your essays. Great. Thank you, Sabine. Another question is, would it be better to have a well-rounded application, meaning showing your ability in many areas, or a focus application with a spike towards a specific area? Definitely the latter. Um, you may have heard other people say this already, but schools want a well-rounded class, not a well-rounded person. Basically, they want to have a class of people who are good at, you know, like their particular forte. Like if you're, um, if you're a varsity person, they want like the best um, athlete. If your forte is writing, they want like the best writer, things like that. So although I said like, it's good to have your, um, extracurriculars well-rounded, there should also be one that you emphasize. Thank you, Sabine. Um, a lot of attendees also wanted to ask for advice regarding English language tests like the TOEFL or IELTS. So do you have any tips for preparing for those? Yeah. So honestly, those English proficiency tests are really not that hard because um, schools in the Philippines prepare us really well for these. And as long as you have a good understanding of the English language, um, it's really not that hard to prepare for. I just answered um, a couple practice exams online. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's really not um, a big deal. It's, it's super simple. Lang. Great. Next question is, did you ask for recommendation letters from any of your junior high school teachers? Since you mentioned you transferred schools and probably your junior high school teachers would know you better. Yes, I did. Because um, in senior high, um, which is only two years, grade 11 and 12, my whole grade 12 was online. So definitely, yeah, I agree that my junior high teachers knew me better. So um, even if I had already left that school, I still had their um, contact information and I still emailed them and they were willing to write me a recommendation still. Great. Another question we have is regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think that a lot of people were impacted by the pandemic. So will universities be aware of the fact that we can't participate in certain, certain co-curriculars or extracurriculars due to these circumstances or even not being able to take certain tests? Yes, so in my year of applying, um, mine was like really peak of COVID. Um, and a lot of SAT schedules were being canceled and stuff. Um, and schools were understanding of this by making the standardized test requirement optional. But as COVID is like gradually starting to die down, especially in the US, um, they may have different expectations for the students this batch, like um, getting like participating in extracurriculars. Maybe they won't be as um, for considerate anymore, and. It's nice if you can find like a workaround um, 
with these restrictions. Like um, Maya mentioned in my introduction that I was I founded Salamat Bayani, providing PPEs to retail frontliners. I was able to um, do this project despite um, it being the peak of COVID at that time. So it's really about being creative and seeing what you can do given the current circumstances. Thank you, Sabine. Another question is regarding the financial aspect of college applications. So was that an expensive process and did you utilize the fee waiver option? If not, do you know of any ways that students can avail of fee waivers? Yeah, it, it was quite an expensive process um, because the, the application fees like really add up. Um, let's say you apply to 10 schools and um, they were like $90 each. So that's like almost, that's like $900. So it does get quite expensive. For fee waivers, um, I think the person to best assist you with obtaining one is your guidance counselor. I think what they request is are like, bank statements or you might also have to write a letter on why you need one I'm not exactly sure since I I could not get one um, but definitely your guidance counselor should be able to help you thank you Sabine another question are we allowed to ask for recommendation letters from teachers that have already left our institution yes you can Great, thank you. Another question is, is it okay to not have any competitions that you've or attended in your application? Will this hurt your chances given that a lot of applications specifically have an awards and recognitions portion? Yeah, I never participated in any competitions just because my schools, like um, we didn't really get the opportunity to participate in those. So in the certificates and recognitions portion, I think um, I put my academic achievements. I put um, a leadership recognition I received from my school, but I did not have any like um, certificates from like comp contests, competitions. All right. Another question is, in your own opinion, what do you think are the pros and cons of studying abroad? For this, you could just give a short list of both. Yeah, I think um, the biggest pro for me is the academic program and the resources of the school, especially if you're in a field like me, like STEM, um, because I think their um, facilities are comparably nicer and better equipped. And um, me, I'm studying dentistry and the, I didn't have many options uh, for dental schools here in the Philippines. That's why I really opted to study abroad. So. I think it really mainly depends on what specifically you're studying. I think for STEM, it, it's definitely um, better, in my opinion, just because of, like I said, the program and the facilities and stuff. A con um, first is the cost. It is comparably... Um, more costly studying abroad because there are a lot of things you have to consider like um, your living expenses, um, traveling there and traveling back here to see your family. And obviously the main thing would be being far away from your family. So that was a really big thing for me that I had to just accept but thankfully, naman, um, it's 
very, very easy to stay in touch with your friends and family, wherever they are, of course, because of social media. But yeah, those are some of the main things. Thank you, Sabine. Lifting off your previous answer, did you have any relatives in the place that you chose to study abroad? If not, how were you able to cope? And was it hard for you to be away from your family? Yeah, so like I said in a previous slide, one of the main things I considered when choosing my school is whether I had relatives in close proximity. So I chose Tufts because I have an auntie who lives right in Boston. And for example, there are long weekends or I just want to um, visit her and have good Filipino food and relax. I am able to easily go to her house. And I also just had, I also just finished an internship um, this summer in Boston and I was able to live with her obviously for free um, for that entire duration. As for adjusting to being far away from family, I personally, for some reason, I don't know why, I never felt homesick, not one moment since I um, left for Boston. Um, and I think this is mainly due to the fact that I call my family several times a day. I mean, it's all personal preference how often you want to um, be in touch with them. But personally, yeah, my family and I call multiple times a day. Um, sometimes it is um, sad to be far away and missing um, birthdays and stuff like that. But um, you always have your vacation home to look forward to. So whenever um, I'm feeling sad or demotivated, I just think about when my next flight home will be and um, it instantly lifts my spirits. Thank you, Sabine. Another question that we got is regarding what school you come from. So is it still likely for students who come from lesser known high schools to get accepted into universities abroad, especially more prestigious ones? Oh yeah, um, the school you come from isn't that big of a contributor to whether you get admitted or not. It's, it's really more of your credentials, your accomplishments, your achievements, your grades, and like I said, your essays that matter most. Thank you, Sabine. So another question that we have is, how do you find orgs or internships to join? Um, is this for in college or high school? I think you can answer from the perspective of an, like a student applying to colleges, but you can also share your experiences as a college student as, uh, in terms of seeking internships and extracurriculars yourself. Okay, so in high school, um, most of my extracurriculars were leadership positions, um, like being class president in high school or, um, I also was executive council rep of our COMELEC, and I also was, I also had a leadership position in our school's Filipino club. Then um, I had, I founded a youth organization one summer, and that that's ALTA, and I also did, um, that little project called Salamat Bayani to provide PPEs for retail frontliners. So you know, most of my activities were um, school positions, but I also had a couple that I just did on my own. Um, usually, I think schools have limits on how many orgs you can join within the school. So a way to work around this is by um, joining orgs outside school, such as ALTA or CAMP. Um, I was also part of CAMP when I applied to high school, and um, I believe I also wrote an essay about it. So that was quite helpful. 
as for internships, um, I personally didn't have an internship when I was in high school. I only um, got my first internship in college um, just because I couldn't find or think of a lot of internships related to my course of study, which is dentistry, that are open to high school students. It's a little bit difficult. So um, me, as an example, having an internship in high school um, is not that important in your application, although it can be helpful if you have one, but it's not like a make or break that you don't have an internship, you won't get in. Yeah. All right, thank you, Sabine. So I'm going to be asking the final questions for our talk, but if any of you have specific questions regarding extracurriculars, standardized testing, timelines, such as when you should take the SAT, ACT, things like that, then we highly recommend that you check out the rest of our panels and talks that will be covered later in the conference. You can refer to the newsletter for the full schedule for those talks and panels. Now, this, one of the last questions we will be having today what do you wish you would have known during the college application process? Um, I wish I would have known how stressful it actually is to write essays. It was one thing that I um, personally put off on the, not no man super last minute, but I did it quite later in my application season um, but they actually take a long time to conceptualize brainstorm um, put together and you're in my experience I ended up um, writing like several versions of um, answers for the same question and then like I said you also have to tweak these essays to perfectly fit the prompt um, so like I said, definitely, definitely start those early, like this summer while you're not yet, um, in school, because it's hard to balance schoolwork, um, with writing essays, plus also reviewing for the SAT if you haven't taken it yet, or if you're going to take it again. So, um, if there was one thing I would change it would be writing essays earlier. Thank you, Sabine. Now for our last question for this talk, what advice do you have for incoming seniors who are anxious about the college application process and are worried that they're not going to achieve their desired colleges? This is a very, very, very common concern for almost every um, applicant. I had the exact same worries. Honestly, the mindset I just have is if, if I didn't get in, then, you know, it's just not meant to be. Um, like, may, like, perhaps you would be better off in another school. You'd be much happier in a different school. The only reason why... Um, these admissions officers reject students is if they see that this student might not um, be like the best fit for this school. Like this student might um, have a challenging time um, keeping their grades up in this school, or maybe um, there weren't that school is not going to be able to match the student's expectations. Um, so really the application is to show the admissions officers who you are as a person. And if they reject you, it just means that there's a better school out there for you. Thank you, Sabine. That concludes our talk for today. I'm sure you still have many questions, but we're unfortunately at the end of our time together. If you want to contact our speaker directly, you can reach them at sabine.flaminiano at gmail.com. We'll also be putting her email address in the chat 
if you didn't catch that. Thank you so much, Sabine, and to our participants. We hope you learned something new. See you at our next event. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I'd also like to shout out Risa K. Chua, who is an attendee and was a previous camp president. Thank you for coming.